Welcome, everyone. My name is Isilias Papayuano, and I'm professor of economics at the London Business School, and I also serve as academic co-director of the Wheeler Institute for Business and Development. Let me just welcome you all in this uh, teaching initiative that with my great friends and colleagues, Leonard Vansekon, Nathan Nunn, and Stelios Michalopoulos, we designed and curated a couple of months ago. Yes. Let me thank uh, the fantastic team of the Willard Institute for Business and Development. There are many challenges and we hope uh, uh, that all of us all across the world uh, are able to listen and attend those uh, series. Let me just say that uh, the Willard Institute was established a couple of years ago with a very generous gift of Tony and Maureen Wheeler, founders of Lonely Planet, who actually have featured Africa, the beautiful continent, uh, and it has shown its beauty, its diversity, uh, and its passion across the world. Now, what are we trying to achieve with this teaching initiative? We want to illustrate academic research in economics, Research touching first order issues regarding to the role of history on the long run development of Africa. It's various regions, it's various countries, it's various and diverse ethnic uh, and religious and other kinds of groups. So our first objective when we design this course is to foster a dialogue between economics and other social sciences, history, political science, cultural anthropology, psychology, not to say business and management. We believe that economics has a lot to learn from those areas if it humbly embraces them. We understand that quite often many of our colleagues in economics have viewed other social sciences a bit with arrogance, with a, a top eye viewpoint, but the recent research that we're going to cover extensively in the, uh, in the next uh, uh, three months effectively are going to abstract from the paradigm of economics before and try to learn from other areas, mostly history, policy science, and cultural anthropology. We believe that this course uh, will, will benefit from the insights of all of, of all of us. We all come from a very diverse background. So let me just take, uh, we have decided with Leonard, Nathan and Stelios not to show any slides. We will share a lot of administrative issue uh, with, the, uh, uh, with uh, constant emails. Let me just share uh, an, an illustration of our virtual community. So for this course, we had close to 26,000 registrations. Let me just say here that Leonard, Nathan and I, uh, and Stegos and I were very humbled to see this huge interest. Uh, we never anticipated uh, that uh, an issue as, uh, on African history will touch the hearts of so many colleagues, friends and associates all across the world. Uh, we have considerable participation. Actually, the majority uh, of our virtual community comes from people uh, in Africa. Uh, actually, for many countries, we have more than 1,000 or more than 500 uh, participants, uh, as well as Europe and other parts of the world. However, what is equally important for us, because when we designed this course, we wanted to foster a dialogue between different uh, uh, social sciences, and we don't want this to be a monologue or a lecture from economics to the other social sciences, is that we all have a very diverse kind of background. Uh, illustrated here. And most importantly, you know, we have many friends here in this uh, virtual room who not only have studied economics, but many other uh, uh, disciplines in social sciences, business, accounting, political science, even computer science, not to say uh, history and development economics. So we want to keep this introduction short. So let me pass now the floor to my great friend and colleague, uh, Stelios Michalopoulos from Brown University. Stelio, please. I'm, uh, I'm humbled, basically. I'm humbled to be uh, virtually with uh, so many of you. Um, I never thought that uh, you know, when I started working with Elias on these topics on historical development in a basement uh, in Cambridge 12 years ago, uh, we would be at some point uh, talking uh, to, to, to so many of you. And uh, I'm, really, I'm really humbled. So let me give a little bit of, a, of the background here, like how, how we found ourselves um, asking this type of questions. Um, so, and so I'll be talking basically about what has happened in the economics of development the last uh, 20 years. So in broad terms, the approach to understanding development had been traditionally dominated by two perspectives, the macro and the micro one. On the one hand, from a macro perspective, Countries are the main unit of analysis and the goal is to understand how top-down policies work. 
this view abstracts, of course, from within country differences, as often the comparison is between, you know, the policy in Germany and the policy in the US, uh, how they map into different outcomes over time. In this respect, actually, which is a very Western way to think about countries, countries are often homogeneous entities that react uniformly to a given policy. On the other end, the microdevelopment approach looks at, you know, the goal is to understand which interventions work. And so naturally it focuses on households and individuals that ideally are exactly broadly comparable. So of course this makes sense, right? If you want to, to see which policy works, which intervention works, you want to make an apples to apples comparison. So these are these were the dominant uh, paradigms uh, and could not, for various reasons that I briefly explained, had to abstract from what lies in between the household, the individual, and the state. So all the rich heterogeneity of customs, norms, local, formal, and informal arrangements and rules that condition economic and political behavior had to be swept under the rug. Of course, you know, I'm not here to bash the micro and micro, macro and micro approach. We have learned a lot from those uh, approaches, but our understanding of development will remain incomplete unless we look at what happens, you know, at what lies in between the individual and the state. So this meso level analysis actually is, uh, you know, starts from this realization that we, instead of trying to forget and trying to put under the rug diversity and heterogeneity, we strive to understand it, how it comes about and what are the consequences of this. And of course, you know, once you try to embrace and unpack this diversity, we need to get out of our comfort zone. So we need to get out of our uh, comfort zone of using our beloved and trusted statistics of like GDP per capita or physical capital that all economists are comfortable with and venture into relying on actually our fellow, uh, you know, sci social scientists, anthropologists, folklorists, uh, remote scientists. Why? Because we need to actually get statistics. We need to get a quantification of the phenomena we're trying to understand from them, like from remote scientists to use satellite images of light density at night, millions of pixels of geographic data to get from folklorists, the people's folk tales, from anthropologists and historians to get the, the rich account of the regions and the people we hope to understand. So this course will be mainly a comparativist course, right? So we will be motivated by case studies, examples, but we're going to try to get to some average relationships. So I want to give you just one tip for what is, uh, you know, what can make a successful uh, course. Be active listeners, keep notes. Do not take what we say for granted. Interrogate our reasoning and sources. Interpret our findings in light of our, your own and your community's experience. Write down your ideas on how to extend the existing literature. Send us questions that we plan to answer through the FAQ um, that we will be posting online. Now, what do we envision getting out of this course? I have a short and a long horizon. An immediate fruit of this course is to get your thoughts on what we're missing. What have we gotten wrong? How can we improve? So I really look forward to reading your answers to the surveys we will be sending out periodically. And we promise to get back to you with what we learned from your answers. Perhaps a small step towards the big project of decolonizing science is to start by giving voice to you. For the longer term, I hope that the lectures will lay the seeds for a new generation of African, of Africans based in African university scholars on the social history of the continent so that I will be getting to review and learn from your works. If Elias and I again could write on the historical origins of historical of African development from a basement in Boston, you should be the ones to lead the next round. So this course is an attempt to empower you guys. Thank you, Stelios. Um, so I'm just gonna say a, a few words. Um, I'm super excited to be involved in, in this initiative. I'm uh, ecstatic that there's uh, such a large number of individuals. Uh, that want to join the conversation. Uh, so why am I excited to be here or why do I think this is a particularly important thing to study, uh, namely uh, African economic history? So I'm coming, I guess, from a perspective of economic development. What really one of the things that motivates me in my research are the vast differences of income that you see around the world today. 
if you look at the top 5%, lowest 5% of, of countries, uh, you find that the, the ratio of income is uh, 40. In other words, the richest countries are about 40 times richer than the poorest countries. So that's enormous. Um, and the natural question is, well, why is that? Or how did we get here? Uh, if you go back in time, you find that wasn't always the case, right? So if you go back to pre-1500, for example, the differences in income are maybe uh, 1.5 or 2 maximum uh, between the, the richest societies and the poorest societies, our best estimate. So, you know, where do these come from? A uh, number of things happened in 1500, and subsequently we'll talk about these, uh, the Columbian Exchange, period of globalization, transoceanic trade, that was good for certain societies, but not, not others. Um, I think really you need to understand that historical dynamic process to understand why the world is the way it is today. And that's really what this, this um, uh, series is about, or this series of lectures is about. So another perspective though, as well, you know, the past is in the past. Why do we even need to know the past? Let's move forward right let's not be backwards looking so there's a number of people um, and in development economics in the world that we just want to fix the existing problems right so let's implement policies let's see what works and then let's move on from them and i think this is very natural a reaction is you know there's a lot of people a lot of uh of the world is uh is poor, there's a great inequality, let's try and raise the income levels of those that are, uh, that are poor. Um, but I think an important thing with policy is often I see, and I think there's an inclination to try and want to help, want to fix, but the, I think often we have a tendency not to step back and say, well, what's the problem? What are we trying to fix with these interventions from the West, from the World Bank, from NGOs? Um, and to understand what's the problem, if there is a problem, you really need to understand the setting, the, the society, the institutions, the culture, the environment that you're in. And I think um, it's not always clear that there is a problem in the dimensions that uh, we're implementing interventions, right? And so I think uh, from for development, uh, development economists, um, I think there's huge returns, huge benefits, just trying to understand uh, different parts of the world rather than trying to fix different parts of the world. Uh, and to understand the way, the way the world is today, even at the very micro level, the meso level, uh, you really need to understand, again, the historical, the, the dynamic, the evolutionary processes that got the world or got a setting to be how it is today, okay? Um, and then the other thing is there's many examples, I won't go into them now, but where the efficacy of policy uh, really depends on the details of a particular lease, of a particular setting, which are again, historically determined or evolutionarily determined, just dynamically determined. And so some policies can work really well in one setting, uh, a few hundreds kilometers away, those policies are, uh, completely ineffective, right? And the details have to do with, um, with the processes that uh, cause societies to be certain ways. And so uh, we'll touch on that throughout, throughout the lectures, but I think that's just one thing that I wanted to mention. So for me, even if you're not inherently interested in uh, history, uh, it's super, super important if you wanna understand the inequality that we have around the world today and try and improve upon that. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm extremely, extremely like uh, my other colleagues um, to be part of this initiative. Um, I, I should maybe say a few words about my personal journey uh, through this. Um, when I started my PhD, uh, first at UBC and then later on at Northwestern, I basically, I was so passionate about learning more about African history that I actually designed my own class and approach a professor to actually uh, have a class on, on African history, particularly the history of slavery. Um, so, so, so I always find uh, studying African history very empowering, very stimulating. And it's not just the history uh, from the point of view of states, centralized states, but the history from the point of view of communities and we're ordinary individuals, you know, because throughout the history, obviously there were tragedies, you know, 
uh, war, slavery, and colonialism, and all that. We were also triumphs. We were, you know, raising families, you know, um, you know, developing arts and music and social norms. And it's really, really important for me uh, to be part of this initiative, you know, because as an African, you know, I, there are details, there are nuances that I live through by listening to song, by talking to my parents, that you need, you, you need to bring, bring out. So, so, so for me, for me, regardless what you do, regardless where you're coming from, uh, African history is something um, which is really, really, really important. And uh, develop self-confidence, develop better knowledge about your environments. It's also, as uh, Nathan just said, really critical you know, for policy. You know, for instance, if you, you want to design education policy, um, you know, you have to have a clear sense of what uh, family culture in Africa, you know, like the, your uncle is your dad's culture, which is not the case everywhere, you know, so, so it's, 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 so now this passion for African history, I brought it up in my own kind of social entrepreneurship. When I set up the African School of Economics uh, about in 2010, a central piece of the training is African history. So we also set up, for instance, uh, an Institute of African Studies, and we're currently um, developing a book series on, uh, on African history. So regardless, you know, your subfield, you got to study African history. You know, this is very important. Also, you know, African history is important. It's good for business, you know, because, for instance, I cannot imagine tourism in Africa without uh, being able to showcase how rich, how complex, how fascinating uh, African history is. So. Um, to add to what my colleague have said, you know, what is interesting today is the range of methodology that being used, you know, uh, to, 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 to study Africa, you know, archival materials, oral history, you know, not only, but again, as I mentioned earlier, not just history of states, but history of families, you know, and try so that you can understand how events from the past, um, it is passed through generation of individuals, to lead to the consequent that we all that we observe that we, we observe today. So, so I'm I'm extremely extremely uh, excited and um, about the interest that uh, you all have on this course. We are going to do our best, you know, to meet your expectation. And as uh, uh, Stelios and Elias have said, you know, your contribution, your participation will be essential because this will be a dialogue. This will be for us an opportunity to learn. You know, but I, again, an opportunity also to push you and to, to get you to get very interested in, 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 in the topic that we'll be covering. Thank you very much. So when we first designed the course, uh, we really thought that we would have never imagined such a big interest. So we really wanted to have it as interactive as possible. Uh, sadly, there are capacity constraints at Zoom and the online platforms that does not allow us to have a dual interaction the way we wanted in the beginning. So we have tried and we urge you to participate to do the following uh, modification to our initial plan. First, please, please, please use the questions uh, and post as many questions and comments as you literally can. Second, we have found uh, and we have recruited a great teaching fellow team, uh, bright PhD students and young scholars from Africa and from uh, elsewhere who will run recitations, review sessions. Those will start in week two and you will receive an email with the details. Our idea, and actually we will join a couple of them at least, is to hear from you and have at least in those recitations the ability to have a dual interaction. Thirdly, we will run a questionnaire and for those who want to take this course with some letter of accreditation from LBS Wheeler Institute for Business and Development, we will have some questionnaires where we will ask you both for open-ended answers to questions because our objective here is mostly to listen and hopefully pass also some research evidence that are of your interest. Fourthly, we will be having a weekly frequently asked questions starting with this week. So we will collect the questions, we will try to group them, and then uh, we will try to answer, at least tentatively, uh, as many questions as we literally have.